what I've noticed, Harsh, is even in places like YouTube, the mainstream media is finding ways to infiltrate it. Where in 2015, I, I just used to like watching these like political debates, right? And I, I would see these tiny channels uh, offering their output on... Uh, there's a lot of echoing going on, but I'm assuming it's a StreamYard thing. Um, so there were a lot of these channels uh, that were not a part of any organization that were providing commentary of like a one politician going at another politician or one person calling someone else fake news. They're over here reacting to it. So in 2017, if you just typed in fake news debate, you'd find a lot of these small channels arguing it. Nowadays, if you type it into YouTube, like those key phrases, you see like CNBC, MSNBC talking about it. And you're like, wait a minute, I'm coming to YouTube to run away from you guys, and I'm still finding you guys. So I wonder how much power like the mainstream media has over uh, these so-called like individual platforms like YouTube at this stage. So the reason YouTube shows these guys is that at some point, YouTube changed their policy. Earlier, their policy was more about, you know, what would someone want to watch? But now their policy is a bit like this. Is this a sensitive topic? If yes, we want to show, quote unquote, authoritative sources. And authoritative sources usually means these established news organizations. So, for example, if you search for something like, is COVID real or not? You won't find people like random creators. You will find news organizations. Mm -hmm. And that's what they're doing in politics as well, where they're only sticking to news organizations showing up in the top results. And what this does is it, is it essentially gives these news people a monopoly on a lot of these important search topics. Mm -hmm. But I think that eventually the free market will prevail either on YouTube or some other platform. And eventually we will have, you know, what you want to watch and not what they are forcing you to watch. But I don't know when that day will come. I see some people, some platforms are actually doing quite well in that regard. Like there's this platform called Rumble, which is where Andrew Tate is on now. Mm -hmm. And Rumble seems to be more free speech than YouTube. I was but just going to bring that up. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. The question is, to your point. how many of these platforms will remain free speech is important because even YouTube and Twitter, when they started, they were all about free speech, right? Twitter used to be known for being free speech. Yeah, and that's why I was thinking. It's like 2015 to 2022, it's so different on YouTube. And it's good that you bring up Rumble. Have you ever heard of this guy named Sneeko? I have not, no. So he is a, he's a YouTuber who's been in the game for nine plus years. Like he started when he was 16. And a lot of his followers saw his growth. And as of late, he became someone that's very red-pilled. And he started to hang out with guys like Andrew Tate, Fresh and Fit, uh, a lot more. And he started to... His content started to shift a lot. It went from his early part of his career where he was predominantly an artist to nowadays talking more about political issues, intersexual dynamics, etc. And recently, he was banned off YouTube, right? <laughs> nine years of work. Just think about that, man. Nine years of work is gone. And he had this feeling that he was going to get banned. So he backed up a lot of his stuff. And now it's on Rumble. So... Andrew Tate is a very popular creator. He, uh, he's on Rumble. Suddenly, the Sneeko guy is banned off YouTube, and he's going onto Rumble. And you know, I don't want to speak anything into existence, but this Fresh and Fit uh, podcast, they have a huge following at this point. And just the way that YouTube just pulls the rug out of you uh, out of nowhere, if they do go uh, get banned and they go to Rumble, now Rumble is starting to become a serious threat because a lot of creators are slowly going there. It's very possible. It could be that this entire segment just moves to Rumble and then, you know, more and more people start also using Rumble. It might become a YouTube competitor for sure. However, I think YouTube, if that starts to happen, they will loosen up the censorship a bit just to stop it. Mm-hmm. 
but i think it's the future like non censored social media is the norm and eventually it will be what everyone is using it's only right now that we are stuck in a bad equilibrium where all the audience is using youtube and that's why all the creators are using youtube and that's why everyone uses youtube do you get what i'm saying yeah i mean it's the network effect that's what they have yeah exactly it's a network effect but if they keep doing this bullshit eventually the network effect will go away why do companies always fall for this is it that difficult to allow free speech i mean are there other variables that me and you may be missing out on i think the biggest variable is their employees and their founders right of a company can only exist as a free speech company if it's founded as a free speech company if it's not then eventually the ideology of their employees is going to seep into their policies for example mm-hmm. if you take twitter policy on twitter you can't dead name someone do you know what that is mm so let's say there's a guy and he transitions to a girl that's possible in america apparently and he changes his name from say jack to jackina okay right so now he changes his name on youtube or twitter to jackina and if you call him jack you're banned like if you're intentionally doing it or what what if you just accidentally do it you still get you're banned? banned it doesn't matter if he if that's the, insane if he or she reports you you're banned that's insane but don't you get what it means it means that the rules themselves are leftist and the rules are leftists because the employees are leftist they see this rule as normal they don't see it as bullshit right so they in their mind calling this person jack is a form of bullying mhm and they try to prevent bullying because they are not a free speech platform they don't think this way they think you know we want the speech to be conducive and everyone should be happy that's kind of why youtube got rid of the dislike button even though it was a terrible move for the product itself right mhm like every one, YouTube, yeah i every sort of YouTuber, get but... the guy who's watching youtube the user they want to have the dislike button to know if this is a good video or not because the like button without the dis- dislikes has no relevance yeah sometimes people do like I- i've seen it where someone will make a viral video about someone else and then that person who made the viral video will just start spamming the other person with bunch of dislikes so if a new member is coming to that person's channel they're going to only see dislikes and think oh well this content sucks but in reality it was a viral video that led to a lot of those dislikes but that's an exceptional case isn't it in most cases yeah the like and dislike ratio mm-hmm. actually gives you a good understanding of how good this video is you know who is uh, getting disliked the most us <laughs> no not us we we were getting like left and right i'm talking about these mainstream news organizations <laughs> dude <laughs> have you ever heard of vid iq i have not so vid iq is just this youtube extension where you could look for relevant keywords and you could see someone's percentage of like to dislike ratio and if it's normally green you could tell like this is a very liked video but if it's red that means there's way more dislikes than likes if you see any of these mainstream media organizations it was literally like 6% 2% 1% so i was initially thinking that's why they got rid of the dislike <laughs> very possibly it could be but this is one of those cases where i do also see the other side where uh, there was um what what's a good example um there was this one guy like he, he was this guy that was just hilarious and he was over here roasting at uh, this uh, show and all of his followers just went on that show and just began downvoting it nonstop so this guy like uh, who's just getting flooded with dislikes he's just like what the hell like this guy made this viral video about me and now my content is getting disliked it actually happened to someone on twitter uh, from our side of twitter where he wrote this viral tweet about something about 
handling your kids properly, it went viral, viral. And then a bunch of people went to his Amazon page, bought his book, and gave it a one-star review. Now, this guy makes most of his money from Amazon. And nowadays, people are coming to Amazon, and they're just seeing a bunch of one-star reviews like, oh, I guess this product sucks, not knowing that it was from a viral tweet. Yeah, I, I know there are problems with the system, right? And it gets exploited every once in a while. But, but the system is there for a reason. The dislikes are useful. To get rid of dislikes just because someone can exploit them doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? Mm. See, what you're saying is a bit more like this, okay? Let's say there's a medicine that can save someone's life. Right. But the medicine side effect is that, you know, it can if you die, the death becomes really painful. Now, there are some people who need this medicine and they're not taking it because they're afraid of the pain. And mm -hmm. your, your suggestion is, okay, let's get rid of this warning at so that, you know, everyone's taking it. But that warning still gives you the option of, to choose, right? Yeah, it gives you the option to choose. Let's not forget, though, the... YouTube initially did not have a dislike button. Um, it had a five-star rating thing, right? I don't think it initially, like when YouTube was first becoming a thing, like 2005-ish, it was just pure content. And then over time, I, I believe the like button became a thing. The views was always there. 